All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're at in the world. Uh, my name is Hunter Smith with Metastock, and I'm excited to bring you this webinar today uh, with uh, um, Stuart McPhee. He's going to be presenting Five Unbreakable Rules of Trading, which I'm very excited to learn about. Um, first off, though, if you guys have watched webinars with us before, you know that we kind of have to get the, the disclaimer, the legal stuff out of the way. Uh, so this demonstration is designed to instruct you on using Metastock and accompanying software plugins. It's not a recommendation to buy or sell, but rather guidelines to interpreting and using the specific indicators and features within the software. The information, software, and techniques presented today should only be used by investors who are aware of the risk inherent in trading. Metastock shall have no liability for any investment decisions based on the use of our software, any trading strategies or information provided in connection with the company. There, we got the boring part out of the way. Um, I'm excited, uh, like I said today, to uh, have a very special guest, Mr. Stuart McPhee. Uh, Stuart's been trading for a very long time, been very, very successful at it, so much so that um, he has writ uh, written a, a um, best-selling book that is in, I believe it's third iteration now. He will probably correct me on that. Uh, he's a trading coach, and he does uh, live events um, all over uh, Asia as well as Australia. So um, when we started working with Stuart a few years ago, um, you know, we were very excited because we really enjoyed the simplicity, uh, simplicity of his system. And we had to have it in Metastock. Uh, so we've been working with Stuart for a couple of years now, and his trade launch systems has been one of our most popular add-ons over the last couple of years. And I think it really is due to the simplicity in it. Um, and honestly, the education behind it, uh, because when Stuart does a webinar, uh, he does it in such a way that, that every trader of all levels can really understand um, the finite points of his trading system. Uh, also, he hits on one of my favorite topics, and that is the psychology of trading. Um, and that is eliminating the emotion, walking away from your keyboard once you place a trade. So I'm not going to give away all of the secrets. I'm going to let uh, Stuart take it away from here. Without further ado, uh, here is Stuart. Stuart, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Wonderful. So I'm going to change the presenter over to you. And should prompt you to share your screen. Perfect. Looks great. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Hunter, for that very kind introduction. And I also extend my welcome and a good afternoon or evening or morning as it is here in Australia. Um, thank you very much for your company. It is indeed my pleasure to be with you here uh, for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. I'm very humbled by the number of attendees who have actually joined us for this session without disclosing numbers. It might be the biggest webinar I've actually been a part of with Metastock. So thank you for all of those who have chosen to spend the next hour or so with me and hopefully I can uh, reward that um, by providing you some interesting ideas and some food for thought. And of course, I must correct you, Hunter. My, my book is now in its fourth edition. So um, <laughs> you said I'd correct you and I did. So thank you very much for the introduction. In any event, I appreciate it. You'll notice thank you. the date. Under, the under promise, <laughs> over deliver. <laughs> You'll notice, you'll notice the date on this particular presentation um, down the bottom. Hopefully you can see that on your screen. And that's because um, I actually presented this particular session uh, in London uh, last week. In fact, there may even be people who were in that room who are listening in on this webinar right now. Um, I presented at the London Forex show last Friday in London. And I thought, you know what, what a great time. I've just sort of put this together for that particular um, for that particular event, I thought I could definitely um, come and give that to the Metastock uh, clients as well and, and pass on uh, that information in this particular session. So that's what I've chosen to do. A lot of the things that I'll cover today, if you have ever heard me speak before, then I'm going to repeat myself a little bit. And there's a reason for that, a couple of reasons. One 
is a lot of the things that I talk about, I strongly believe are time tested, uh, stand the test of time, are applicable in 2019 as they were in 2009 and 1999. And whilst the markets change and what have you, I believe a lot of things do stay the same. So that's why I think it's important that these things sort of underlying principles do remain sort of quite constant um, in the markets, regardless of what else is going on. But the other thing, the other reason why I think it's important is because I believe a lot of these things are so important, you cannot hear them often enough. And the more you hear them, the likelihood or the greater chance of it actually sinking in and you know making a difference with you and having an impact and having you change the way you do things. So that's why I sort of make that concession early on that I will say a few things that I've probably said to you or other audiences before, no doubt. Before I get going, one of the things that I often do at the beginning of a presentation, and I did just this um, last Friday in London, a lot easier with an audience standing and you know sitting in front of you. And what I do is I talk about um, a simple story, and that is I've worked out of a home office now for nearly uh, 20 years. In fact, I'm sitting in it right now. Um, and I've had the pleasure of all of my children are still at school. Um, I've had the pleasure over the years of actually walking them to school uh, and walking them home from school on a daily basis. Um, as they have got older, they have obviously become less enthusiastic about that than I have. And as they've got older, that sort of uh, frequency has dropped off a little bit to the point where, of course, my eldest daughter has next to no interest in her father accompanying her walking home from school. But nevertheless, I would often want to engage them after school with what they have just gone through during that day and what they've learnt and what have you. And as many parents in this audience can probably relate to. Often I would ask simply, you know, how was your day? And I would get this four letter word in response all the time. And that four letter word was good. Just good, 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 good. Um, and I thought, I'm not getting anywhere. I actually genuinely am interested in what they're doing. I want to engage. I'm not doing this just to pass the time. I said, no, no more. You are not allowed to use the word good ever again when you respond to my questions about how was your day? Okay, dad, no problem. So next day, how was your day? Fine. Okay, I'm sick of these four letter words. I said, There's, there must be a better way. Um, I thought, let's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all about data. I'm all about numbers. I think that's what trading is very much about. Obviously there's psychology as Hunter sort of alluded to, but very much it's all about numbers. It's about price. And one of my unbreakable rules today, which I'll get onto very shortly, is having data, data, drive your decisions. Um, be very clinical in your approach. And I think that will stand you in good stead. So I said to my children from now on, I simply want a number in response to, to answer how was your day? How good was your day? How much did you enjoy it? I want a number from zero to 10. I want zero utter despair and depression and never want to go back to utter exhilaration at the other end of the scale of a 10. And <clears throat> I would get a better feel for how their day was. Of course, this could extend to other things. How much do you want to see that movie? How much did you enjoy that movie? How much did you want this for dinner? And all of a sudden, we can be very, very, very clear and very precise about how we feel about things. So what I do with the audience is I say, have a think about your own trading right now and have a think about your level of satisfaction with your performance, with your results, and generally how your trading is going. And apply a scale of zero to 10 to your performance, to your results, and how you feel about your trading. Zero being complete waste of time, to 10 of this is the greatest thing and you know utter exhilaration of your performance. And I ask people just to have a think about a number which best reflects their level of you know satisfaction with performance and results. So I say anyone a 10, hands up, and of course no one. Anyone a zero, no one. One, two, a few hands start to go up. How about eight or nine, maybe one? Everybody tends to congregate, just like a bell curve, right in the middle, um, you know, right around that four, five, six. But obviously we're trying to aim somewhere closer to 10. I think 10 is unrealistic, personally. But surely we're looking for an eight or a nine. And when we are a four, five, six, there is some gap between that and an eight or nine. 
And I often put down that gap to a matter of execution. I call that an execution gap. I think people recognize that there is a gap. I think they understand that, okay, this trading thing is not working out as well as had I, you know, I'd expected. I'm not getting the results that I would like. There's clearly a gap between what I'm currently achieving and where I would like to be. And I often refer to this as an execution gap. And I say that because a lot of people that I speak to, and I'm sure many people in this audience right now, have a pretty basic grasp of what trading is. They understand the idea of long and short and buying and selling and the sizing of positions and setting stops and targets and you know maybe trailing exits and conducting some form of analysis, looking at a chart, using indicators, uh, using a moving average, putting some lines, support and resistance, and I could go on. I have a fairly basic grasp of what trading is. What they struggle to do is put some of these pieces together to develop what is really a fairly robust, you know, follows the time tested principles trading plan that they will implement with confidence. That often is the issue. Um, and then when they do have the plan, then it comes down to that six inches in between your ears. And that is your ability, your mental ability to actually execute and implement that plan. So the execution gap is real. It's prevalent, like it's basically everywhere. And there's often, a, you know, this execution gap and we need to somehow bridge that gap. And often that gap just really comes down to the individual and understanding the importance of, you know, the discipline and the patience and what have you and all those other character attributes, which I won't speak about much today, but all those other things, which again, you've no doubt uh, heard about. So in line with that, again, if you've heard me speak before, I've put this particular slide up, must be 2,000 times over the years, I really strongly believe that you need to develop a trading plan that's right for you and then obviously have the right things going on within you so far as mentally and your mental approach to obviously execute and implement that plan you know, with great confidence and great control and great discipline, but also some restraint and some patience uh, as well. And one of my excuse me, one of my uh, unbreakable rules I'm going to talk about very, very shortly is the importance of timing, the importance of you developing a trading plan that actually reflects the sort of trading style that you are interested in implementing. And that to me is incredibly obvious, but not so obvious to some people. And um, once you know, I sort of explain it, hopefully it becomes more obvious to you and you understand how, in fact, critical it is. And it seems quite straightforward, but it really does control of a lot of other things or determine how you do other things within your trading plan, in my opinion. <clears throat> All right, the three M's, you know, obviously, sorry, I'll just go back one slide. I got this idea from Dr. Van Tharp um, when I first read his book back in the late 90s, Trade Your Way to Financial Freedom, and he came up with these three components. He talked about your trading system, your money management, and your trading psychology. Dr. Alexander Elder talks about the three M's, and I've adopted that as the three M's. And I, in my, uh, I believe it was my fourth edition of my book, Hunter, I'll just uh, refer to that again. Um, I actually did my own little market wizards chapter within that book. And I actually went back to Dr. Van Tharp and said, would you be interested in answering some more questions? Um, and he assigned different weightings to this, these particular three components. He, he applied 60% to your psychology, 30% to money management, and 10% to your system or your, your strategy or methodology. And I went back to him as part of my little market wizards uh, part in my book. And I said, do you still believe in that 60, 30, 10? His answer I thought was quite interesting. He's a psychologist and he came back and said, no, I don't believe that's the case anymore. He said, anything we do is all about actions. It's about us doing things. He said, trading is 99% psychology. Um, so you can make of that what you will. But I, I, I see that, I understand that, um, that it is such a large component. This is really just breaking down those three M's. I'm not teaching you anything here you don't know already. Methodology is, you know, whatever form of analysis you use, whether it be astrology, I say that tongue in cheek, a technical analysis, fundamental analysis, combination of those two, having a process to enter trades. I'll talk about that shortly. How we look after our money um, and obviously the glue that keeps it all together. And that is the, obviously our mental capacity and our mental ability and the psychology of actually implementing uh, all this. Just very quickly before I get into my unbreakable rules, I'll just talk a little bit more about my 
thoughts and put all this into context for you. I believe very much trading is a rules-based uh, activity. It's very much a process. Uh, and I also believe traders are very good at what they do. Um, you would have read about that theory of the level of competence with 10,000 hours of you know, learning and application. Um, you know, a lot of people come into trading. I certainly did thinking this really cannot be that difficult. You only have to buy and sell. Is that it? Like, is there anything more to it? Um, it can't be that difficult. In fact, it might be quite easy. And then I think a lot of people think that, and then we soon realise that it's probably the hardest easy money around. Um, traders are good at what they do. They are disciplined professionals and they've certainly allocated a fair amount of time putting themselves in that position. Um, quickly about your trading plan. Again, I need to get onto my unbreakable rules here. Your trading plan needs to have three questions at a minimum answered. These are the three. How do you get into a trade? How much money do you commit? And how do you get out? And then if you rank them in importance, I actually find them reversed. How you get out, I believe, is the most important. How much money you commit and how you allocate capital is also very, very important. And then in a distant third place is how do you actually get into the trade in the first place. If you were to ask most people starting out, where do they allocate their energy, their time, where's their focus in those three areas? And clearly, under what conditions will you enter a trade dominates you know, our efforts and it dominates all of our focus in where we're trying to work out this puzzle of putting a trading plan together. Well, isn't that fair to say? I think that's how most people uh, sort of attack trading. Again, I did. It was obvious. I was intuitive. Clearly, that's the starting point, how you get into a trade. Everything else I'll work out later. So it was just intuitive to think that, well, that's where all my energy is going to go. And I digress a little bit, but then all of, all of a sudden we are looking for strike rate, we're looking for something that which gives us a really, really good probability of actually working out. We're looking for something that gives us a profitable trade on a quite a regular basis and quite a high chance of that happening. We look really for a high strike rate. And again, we sort of realise over time that that's not as important as we probably thought it was, even though that's you know intuitive to think that is the case. Okay, my belief on strategies, this is a little bit more practical now, then I'll get into my unbreakable rules. Um, these are my sort of core, really strong beliefs about strategies. Um, I really believe in zooming out to get perspective. I also believe in trend trading. I believe in trading with the most obvious direction. I know you can trade against trend and trade retracements, and I understand the different ways in which people can attack the market and, and look to take advantage of opportunity. I'll just quickly go to Metastock uh, for the first time. Um, today, and then I'm looking at a chart here of the Australian dollar. Now, this is the Australian dollar against the US dollar. This is a daily chart, and you can see, you know, since really for the last six months or so, so coming back to this sort of period of time back here, um, back here, um, you know, for that period since up to now, it really hasn't moved a lot, and the the ranges there I've got driven are drawn in are like 70, 50, and 73 cents. So that's, in a, that's a 250 pip sort of range there or 2.5 cents range in between this level down here and up here. And for the most part, that currency pair has traded within that particular range. So if you were looking at this in a particular time frame, you could put up a fairly strong argument that this really isn't trading in an obvious direction. You know, for the last six months, it's fairly much traded sideways albeit within a range, but not a significant range. Uh, the Australian dollar, if you look over its history, of course, has moved in, and here we are right down in this bottom right-hand corner down here, and you can see that right down here, and you can see over time it has actually moved significant ranges. It has actually moved um, reasonably well for an extended period of time, and here we are zooming in right now to this very, very narrow range over the last six months or so. So to me, over a particular time frame, there's no obvious direction. Now, people will want to trade, they'll force it, they'll try to find something. But I really do believe in just trading with obvious direction. If something is clearly moving in a direction, and I'll show you some stocks very shortly, then that's what I believe is important, to trade those obvious directions. I don't believe in trading every signal or strategy. I believe in quality over quantity. Again, I think that's probably counterintuitive. People think the more opportunity you, you give yourself to make money, i.e. the more trade you enter, the greater chance you have. 
I don't believe that at all. I believe restraint is very, very important, and I really strongly believe in quality over quantity. I don't believe uh, quantity when it comes to trading is a very good thing at all, even though, again, I think that's probably an intuitive thing. Uh, the more opportunities I get in, the, you know, the more opportunities I have to make money. A few more things. I do believe in higher time frames producing better, more accurate trading signals. I'll talk about this shortly, but if I was to go into Metastock right now, uh, this is the real-time version, so it allows me to have a few more options with regards to chart periodicity, how the chart is broken up. So you'll see there in the bottom right-hand corner, you know, I do believe that it can be very tempting to move right up towards the top of this particular menu. Other trading platforms, whether it be MT4 or other, you know, uh, broker platforms when it comes to intraday trading, you know, currency platforms and the like, will offer even more time frames than this. And I think that can be a bit of a problem. We can be tempted to really focus in on those very narrow time frames. I'll talk about that in a little bit, but I do believe you know, if we slow things down a bit, I do believe we get more accurate trading signals. That's just my personal opinion. I believe that with the, actually I will provide a very simple example right now. I'll just take this Australian dollar chart right now and break it down into a one minute chart as an example. So I'll just give that a second to load up. <clears throat> so here's a one minute chart of the Australian dollar just over the last, what's that, a couple of hours. I'll just come back a few more hours. So I've probably got about six to eight hours there on that chart. Uh, that's a one-minute chart. You know, I, I, I don't see a lot in this chart. I see a lot of yeah, blurriness. I see a lot of mess. Um, this particular currency pair has moved less than 0.2 of a cent, right, 20 pips, in about six, seven hours, which is not a lot. And I just personally believe there's, there's just not a lot of logic there's not a lot of flow. There's not a lot you can explain here of why price is doing what it's doing and what have you. Um, if I change that to a daily chart as an example, and I know I'm just looking at a currency pair right this second, I could apply this to a lot of different stocks and indices and the like. I think there's a lot, a little bit more logic. And if I look at these lines here I've drawn in at 7050 down here, and I've seen the number of times that this particular currency pair has bounced off that particular level. And again, more recently in the last few weeks, bounced off that level and moved away. And likewise, this 73 cent level, the number of times it's come up to that level and been you know, rejected, again rejected, I know it broke through here, again rejected at this level. Um, I see a lot more logic there. I can, I can sort of provide an explanation of why price has done that at those two particular levels. Obviously, I'm talking about support and resistance, and you can explain that. I can provide a fairly you know, plausible argument as to why price has bounced off those levels. Uh, I won't in this particular session, but I've done that plenty of times before. When it comes back to that one-minute chart, I really don't think there's a lot you can explain. You know, How do we know what's going on in the next minute? Um, what does the last minute mean? Um, again, that's just personal opinion. Uh, that won't stop some people wanting to trade those time frames. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, one more, if I may, uh, and then we'll get into the, the really the crux of the presentation, which I'm eventually making my way around to. Um, Hunter actually mentioned this in the introduction, and that is the actual execution of trades, putting them on and actually moving away and not doing, you know, not touching them. I really do believe in letting trades run their course and leaving them alone. I do believe there's an issue. There can be difficulties or complications arise when you want to stare at charts and actually just watch trades unfold. And, you know, it can be very easy just to sort of um, interfere. And as I say often, and I mean no offence by it, each individual is the weakest link in their trading. It's not the platform. It's not the trading rules you put in place. It's not necessarily your form of analysis. It is you. You are the weakest link, like it or not. Um, so <clears throat> the the more you can do to remove yourself from that, I think the better off you'll be. And that's why I talk about not interfering, letting trades run their course and just leave it alone. Um, we now have platforms which allow you to set up the entire trade um, as you execute. You can set a you know take profit level, a stop loss level, a trailing level as you in fact you know put the trade on. You can set all that up and go away and never touch that trade again. That's possible, and I think for a lot of people that's advantageous and should certainly be explored further and um, determine whether you should use that or not because I think it's a good thing uh, personally. 
Okay, these are my five unbreakable rules. I don't want anything here to come across as, oh my heavens, that's groundbreaking. I've never heard of that before. I just want these to, I want to sort of reaffirm what I, you know, that I really believe these are important. And I want to provide some just simple things to illustrate and back up why I believe these are unbreakable. You just give me a moment, please. Okay, firstly, data or data-driven decisions. Look, I come back to technical analysis often. I am a technical analyst. Um, you know, I do spend probably more of my time on currencies now more than stocks, although my beginning was with stocks and I still have an interest in them uh, through my superannuation or retirement uh, money. Um, and, you know, currency market is a very news-driven market. Uh, right this second, we can talk about OPEC, we can talk about Brexit, uh, we can talk about the Federal Reserve and what they go on about all the time. It's a very news-driven market, but I really still believe in the value effectiveness of technical analysis. And at the end of the day, technical analysis all comes back to numbers and data driving, you know, what we see on a chart or what we see elsewhere. I love the clarity of charts um, <clears throat> and I just am a huge fan of technical analysis. And I think the more you use it, the more it works out for you and helps you and stops you getting into a lot of trouble, clearly that just reinforces and, and ramps up that confidence you have in that particular uh, approach. I'm just a huge believer in having you know, data or data drive your decisions. If I can quickly give you an analogy, if I may, I play a lot of golf. I play twice a week. Um, I played yesterday. I'm on the committee at my golf club and we've just, and any golfer will understand what exactly what I'm about to say. Um, for handicap purposes, every hole is rated one to 18 and they're rated based on difficulty to ease. So the most difficult hole on the course will be rated one and the easiest 18. And what that allows you to do is go along and, as members and play the course and, and use your handicap and, and get assistance if you need it, so to speak. All of that ratings of the, or rankings of the holes comes from data, comes from numbers. So we've actually just done the review again on our two courses and it's all driven from thousands and thousands of rounds of golf that have been played by members on those two courses, on those holes. And we can get the average score for every single hole and determine what is the most difficult hole to what is the easiest hole. And we've found that over time, those numbers have changed and therefore we now have a new ranking system. And I put this to a, new, a few members and I emailed them to them last night and said, oh, look, here's the new rankings. And they've all come back. This is fantastic. Um, I thought that was the case. And there's no argument. There's no subjectivity involved. No one can stand up and go, oh, that's, that's just rubbish. That's trash. That's not the case at all. That's clearly more difficult or that's definitely an easier hole. You cannot argue. We have thousands and thousands of rounds of golf and numbers which say, by the way, 1 to 18, here they are rated. You cannot argue with this. I'd love to hear the argument because there isn't any. It's an incredibly clinical, objective, unemotional, you know, 100% um, clinically data-driven um, decision that's been made. I believe there is a lot of value in having a very similar approach when it comes to the markets removing that subjectivity, removing that emotion, not having any stories cloud your judgment about Brexit and the people and watching some interview about some person and how that's going to impact him and you getting sort of caught up in that. I really do believe in the value of having, you know, data drive your decision making. The largest companies in the world have business intelligence units. They have whole sections of people doing analytics on data. I'm sure Metastock does exactly the same where they track sales and track revenue and, and then that goes to the highest levels of decision making and they're able to make a well-informed decision based purely on data, not on emotion. How much does our emotion get involved when we come to trading? All of us have gone through an incredible roller coaster and yes, Stuart, emotions can very much part, play a part in our trading. So anything we can do to remove that um, I think is much better for us in our trading um, and our approach and what have you. Um, so again, I'm not teaching you anything new here so far as this, um, but when it comes to 
to data to numbers. These are also very, very important numbers as well. I call them the key performance numbers. Winning strike rate, losing strike rate, average profit, average loss. And again, if you were to say what's the most important here, a lot of people would think number one is the most important. But you know what? They're all pretty important. And the combination of all these really leads to whether we're actually going to make money or not. A simple analogy of numbers and how important all the numbers and all the data is and probability and what have you. And I learned this from Greg Morris. Greg Morris is very well known to Metastock and the Metastock users. And I remember hearing Greg Morris speak once and he, and he gave this very, very simple story. And again, I did this in London last Friday and I went to the whole audience. I said, okay, you all never have a chance of winning a million dollars. All of a sudden they sit up a bit more in their chair. I said, you have a chance right now of winning a million dollars and you only have to pay $100 to play, to play to win a million. And in fact, even better, you have a one in six chance of winning. One in six. Pay $100 or once off, you have a one in six chance of winning $1 million. I said, who wants to play? <sighs> All these hands go up in the air. Of course. I said, that's wonderful. Thank you. I would want to play too. I said, okay, the game we are about to play is called Russian Roulette. They go, oh, okay. I said, who wants to play now? Crickets, right, silence, no hands. Well, what happened? The $100 stayed the same. The one in six stayed the same. The $1 million stayed the same. What changed was the risk. The risk was obviously the negative consequences of uh, of not winning the million dollars. That was the you know that was the the risk. All of a sudden, I you know introduced the risk into the equation. It was very much a piece of data, but you know, the the risk. And when we talk about average loss and losing strike rate, it's all really really critical that we understand all of these numbers and we understand all of this data and we understand all how it influences you know, whether we are going to make money with this trading or not. Very, very important to consider all the data uh, and, and looking at all those numbers, you know, we can remove that emotion and just make very, very well-informed decisions, just like the very largest companies in the world do. Um, if I may just quickly come back to Metastock. As you would know, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are Metastock users. In Metastock, you are allowed to create your own indicators. There is a tool called the Indicator Builder. And just quickly, you can see... Um, well, there's all the Equus ones just there. But at the top of this list here, I have what must be more than 20 there myself. I've either developed for a couple of people or all of those are my own, right at the top, the altitude ones, and then down to my name, you can see there. And if you're looking closely, you can probably get a rough idea of what they in fact do. So the vast majority of these are actually contained within my add-on because I really firmly believe in having numbers and price and data drive my decision making. I think it's really, really important. And a tool like Metastock makes it really, really easy to achieve that. And the more that I can have this data doing calculations and, and presenting a, a report to me at the end, the better off I am. I don't wanna look through 200 stocks or 500. I'd rather look through eight or 10, knowing that there's been quite a, a good mathematical process to actually present those eight or 10 to me, but more importantly, to eliminate the other 190 or other 490. I think that's really important. And then certainly why I've been a huge fan of Metastock over the years is because of this, in fact, this process. And it's, it's the Explorer, it really is. Um, of all the major tools and what have you, um, the Explorer to me is it, it's the thing that's, provided me the greatest value with this software. I mean, I'm not here to sell you Metastock, obviously, but um, it's certainly the one tool. And why? Because it's doing all the numbers. It's it's presenting me based on data-driven decisions. I'm not just finding a story and learning more about that company. I'm actually having all these numbers. Um, and as I said, the vast majority, I'm trying to think of one that's not, are actually in my add-on. Um, and if they're not publicly shown in my add-on, they're actually used in the explorers anyway. Um, so again, all of these are helping me make a more, you know, data-driven uh, decision. I just thought I'd show you that uh, just quickly. Okay. Also important, and I need to just uh, get a wriggle on a little bit, is the periodicity. So 
one of the things that I don't like with uh, charts, actually, I was, I was going to show you one more thing. Sorry, I did a quick scan just before this session started, and this is just uh, large Australian companies. It really doesn't matter where you are in the world, but you know, it's all relatively similar across different markets. So what I've done is I've done a quick scan across all the big companies just on my altitude system. So this is more the medium to longer term system that I would use with my retirement money to, to get into stocks. And I've done, I've done a scan and here's the report from uh, just recently, just before I started this session. So you can see there's a relatively small number. It's not a lot. But better than that, there's hundreds of stocks now I don't need to look through because I haven't simply haven't met my criterion. But what I can do in the Explorer, and again, I'm not here to sell you the software. What I can do in the Explorer, as you would know, is have a variety, a number of columns in that report. But importantly, with those columns of information, not only can I see that information, I can now rearrange the stocks. So rather than being in alphabetical order, I can rearrange them based on those columns of information. So this is my bracket, which is a component of the altitude system, and that is where it positions itself um, over the last period of time, my volatility percentage, and also my volume strength or the volume S there. So for me, I, I want over 100. I know I show a few others here under 100, but I, I want over 100. And if I rearrange them based on the greatest volume strength to weakest, and I'll just grab a couple here or two or three here and have a look at these, we'll just get an idea of what sort of stocks they're in fact finding. If again, just give me a second for them to open up in the background. I've actually had an interest previously in two of these stocks, shouldn't disclose that. Um, this is the first one, which is good group. Again, I always like to zoom out for perspective and you can see where, I, you know, it's probably had, maybe been a completely different company years ago when it did that through the GFC. Um, but since then, it's obviously had a pretty good run. And even in the last 12 months or so, it's uh, what it's appreciated 50% uh, up to around that level now, almost shy of $13. Tassel Group, again, I just zoom out for perspective. And in the last, again, last 12 months or so, it's had a pretty good run down from 350 up to now, almost $5. So again, the, there's been a good strong increase in volume over that period of time, and then Fortescue. Um, again, just zooming out a bit, had a bit of a decline there. And only recently, if you'll notice the trend ribbon, which I use in the expert advisor in the altitude system, it's only recently changed to long. So again, one of the things I talk about is the how long it's been in that established trend for. And if you compare that to the other two, you'll notice the trend ribbon has been green for a lot longer. Wouldn't you agree? However, with Fortescue, it's only recently changed from red to green. So again, when I talk about how long it's been in that new trend for, this might just drop towards the back of that list because of that. I, I prefer things that are in clearly well-established trends that you know have a tendency to just keep going rather than those that have just changed direction in the last few weeks, which it seems Fortescue was probably um, in that basket. But again, you know, just coming back to the report and the beauty of this is being able to just very clinically sort through all of those stocks based on particular numbers, based on data. And I think that's really, really important because again, it just removes that emotion and subjectivity. It removes my ability to come, oh, look, Sydney Airport or there's Mervac Group or there's, I know about them, I heard about them. Um, I've used their services in the last three months, therefore I have some connection with them. And then all of a sudden, guess what? Emotions now play a part and I don't think they should have a part at all in my personal opinion. With periodicity, I just want to drag your attention to one thing, and I think this is a very important exercise for a lot of people who are struggling to, you know, clearly determine their trading style and how they're going to trade. And what I want people to do is to think about now, if you just visualise your ideal, you know, preferred trading style, how do you see yourself in six or 12 months' time looking at yourself at your trading desk or whatever it might be, and you are trading well, things are going well with your trading. What does your trading look like when you are doing that? All of us would be able to think about what our sort of typical average profitable trade duration is. How long would your average profitable trade last for? All of us should be able to put ourselves in a category in the far right-hand column is your sort of typical average profitable trade, minutes to hours, hours to days, days to weeks, or so forth. And if you can put yourself into one of those categories, you can come one to the left 
and all of a sudden I can allocate you a trading style. Now that's just a name, you know, maybe a very short term or short term. So what? To me, the important thing is taking that trading style and selecting a periodicity which best reflects and supports that type of trading. And what I'm getting at here is if someone wants to trade on very, very short term, does a weekly or a monthly chart have much relevance to them? I would argue not. Vice versa, someone interested in sort of really long-term trends over the course of months and, and what have you, do they have any interest in looking at a one or a five-minute chart? Does that play a role in any way, shape or form? It will for some people because they know they want to get in. They've seen a well-established uptrend for the last few months and they can see themselves being in this for months to come. And all of a sudden, we go in and look at the price right now. And then three seconds later, it drops down one cent. And we go, oh, hang on a second. Do we really want to get into this? It just dropped one cent. In the last four seconds, I know because I've been there and I've done that myself. And I look back now, what a complete waste of my time and energy. The one minute chart is not your focus. You have made a decision based on a hugely you know, larger time frame than one minute. Um, so again, I think it's very critical to choose your time frame, but then stick to your time frame and follow that time frame and only follow that time frame. And as I mentioned earlier, we now, unfortunately, whoops, we now unfortunately have, not, not unfortunately, it can be a trap for people where something like a Metastock Real Time and other you know, actual trading platforms have chart periodicities that you can run through and, and, and look at all these different chart periodicities. And what I don't want people to do is what I refer to as running through the menu. And that is looking at a one minute chart and looking for trading opportunities, seeing nothing. Let's move to five minutes. Let's move to 10, 30, one hour, four hour, and looking for opportunities. That to me is not a very good way to trade. Whilst the rules may remain the same, the, the time-tested trading pr principles, the way you apply them over the different time frames is completely different. The way you trade a five-minute chart is different to someone who trades a daily chart. So trying to run that menu, to me, is just a horrible way to trade, in my personal opinion. That's why I believe it's important to identify your time frame and stick to that time frame, in my opinion. Keep it simple. I could spend the next 60 minutes talking about this. When I do sign my book, which happens to now be in its fourth edition, um, I, do, I do always, when people ask me to sign it, I always write, keep it simple. We have a tendency to complicate things. Trading is no exception. I really do believe in simplicity. I believe in simplicity with our analysis, looking at very simple, clean, uncluttered charts of prices, not overwhelming our charts with you know multiple indicators and all these different windows all over the place. You know, the idea of these time-tested trading rules and principles, they're relatively straightforward. If I was to say to one of my children, look, if we buy something at a dollar, we want it to go up. But if it falls down to 90 cents, what we are going to do is we're going to sell it. That's a pretty straightforward concept. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, it's pretty straightforward. And by the way, if we do buy it at a dollar and it gets up to a dollar twenty or a dollar twenty-five, we're going to sell it. Straightforward. That's one of those rules, you know, cutting losses, getting out at 90 cents. It's a pretty straightforward concept. What we have a tendency to do is to complicate things. And I refer to the top line there. It's hard to be simple, simple to be hard. It's very easy for human beings to complicate things. It's actually very difficult for us to simplify things. And I do believe simplicity in trading is really, really useful. I always like to put this image up. This was actually taken from Metastock many, many years ago. Um, and I've used it for many years. In fact, if you look at the time scale on the bottom of that chart, it says 2010, 2011. So I've used this image for a long time. And what all I did was open up a chart of something and I just threw all these, every possible line I could find in Metastock and just threw it all on. Um, and again, if I had to borrow a line from Greg Morris, um, this is not trading, right? This is playing with software. This is the software can do it, so I'm going to do it. Um, this to me is not trading. I, I really believe in simple, clean, uncluttered charts. In fact, if I just go back to Metastock, and even just looking at the chart of the Australian dollar, I had before, I've got a few lines on there to identify some key levels. Uh, likewise, with the ASX 200 index, I've got a few lines on there to identify, again, key levels. Probably drop one down here at 5,400. 
as well. But that's that's it. I could put a moving average on there, maybe. If I need to use and have a look at the volatility percentage, you know, perhaps I'll do that as well and just overlay that without the scale. I'll have a look at that value, which right now is, you know, 0.86%. So I've now got that information and now that I've got it, I can get rid of it. So I do like, you know, very clean charts. Just quickly about focus and keeping it simple, and I know time is escaping me. I just use these lines as some examples. You know, you, you'll go to a CNBC or a Bloomberg or Reuters, and you'll hear that, you know, US market, uh, London market closed higher today, buoyed by bargain hunters, blah, blah, blah. How about uh, next day, shares from a particular ex exchange? We talk about offshore a lot in Australia being such a large island and separated from everything else. So we'll talk about offshore leads. We'll talk about what happens in North America to a lesser extent, Europe, um, better expected profit results, and then investors cash in from the previous two days of gains because of all these other things. Maps are concerned about Brexit or US and China and trade wars or growth or the IMF saying something and OPEC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what we often find on these news sites is I'll explain what just happened in the market today. The market went up 47 points because there was some bargain hunting, uh, because Apple said something, because Google did this. And often I think to myself, they must just have this drop-down menu of 30 different ideas, and I'll just click one for the day. Because they generally really probably don't know. But more so my concern is, and the problem I find for traders is often that doesn't help us make money tomorrow. It just explains to us what happened today. And over a period of time, we could write that similar commentary. We could say that the index went up 47 points and led by the banks or um, there was concerns over this. We could write all that. Anyone who's in the markets on a regular basis could write all that. I don't think it provides anything insightful. It rarely says anything about, oh, by the way, tomorrow the market is expected to do this because of this. Um, it's very reactionary. To me, analysis and simplicity is focusing on those rules that we put in place. And the whole idea of having our rules is to say what's most likely to happen next. That's all we're trying to do. We're looking for probability, what's most likely to happen. And I might be one of the very few people who says this to people as a technical analyst. And I'll just use as an example here, bring up one of those charts. You know, we're looking at the far right hand edge of that chart. Any form of analysis is designed to answer the question, what is most likely to happen now, next, the next week, next month? What's most likely to happen? I will quite often look at a chart, and I'm a technical analyst, and I've been doing this a long time. I will quite often look at a chart and literally just put my arms up and go, I've got no idea. Some charts don't present you anything. There's no obvious direction. There's no real key levels. There's no chart patterns. There's nothing. I'm not saying this is an example of that, but I think it's an unrealistic expectation to strive towards being able to look at every chart and be able to sum it up and work out exactly what's going to happen next. I think that's unrealistic. I think a lot of charts are just a whole lot of mess, and there's really no logical flow whatsoever. That's why I think in, that's why I believe in the importance of simplicity and knowing exactly what your trading plan is and knowing exactly what it looks like. I love this saying from the book, The Way of the Turtle by Curtis Faith, trading is simple, but it's not easy. Simple and easy are very different things. Very different. The, the, the concepts, the ideas in trading, the cutting losses, letting profits run, keeping your trade small, they're all pretty simple concepts. But it doesn't mean it's necessarily easy for us to implement that, and actually put that in place. Uh, just to finish off, uh, number four, I, I believe, again, in a rules-based activity, it's a, it's a process-driven. Uh, that's just my framework that I provide to people. Uh, this can be another session in itself, you know, working out how do we scan our universe looking for trading opportunities? How do we ultimately select those trades we want to put on? How do we determine the exit levels and the like and position size and put those trades on the platform? And as Hunter alluded to in my opening, you know, and then go and do something else. So this to me is very much the important part of having a process. I always put this image up because when it comes to a process, you know, when you see one of these in an organisation in a large room with lots of them and lots of noise and the like, um, there's very much a process behind this. And whilst the payout odds seem reasonably fair, you know, 35 to 1 for a number or 3 to 1 or 2 to 1 uh, for red and black or whatever it might be, seems fairly fair um, and it is does seem quite fair. Um, 
they have an edge and that edge is a zero and the zero ever so slightly tips the odds in their favor and i think as traders we can think in the same sort of mindset if we can with our process develop a set of rules that provides us an edge and gives us a great probability of having a profitable trade and as long as we take care of those other key performance numbers you know and make sure we cut the losses and and achieve a, an appropriate level of reward to risk in our trades and what have you good things may happen please follow a process uh, don't trade randomly don't trade indiscriminately follow a process i can assure you this is what all really really, really good traders do they follow a process very system based um, yeah, and it's a good thing. A few quotes out of the Market Wizards books. Uh, the desire to maximise the number of winning trades or minimise the number of losing trades works against you. The success rate of trades is the least important performance statistic and may even be inversely related to performance. William Eckhart, one of the uh, um, turtle trader guys with Richard Dennis. I like this from Ed Sakoda. There's only three elements of good trading. Those elements are cutting losses and those other two. If you can follow th these three rules, you may have a chance. Um, I love this one. Learn to take losses. The most important thing in making money has nothing to do with your profitable trades. Nothing to do with your profitable trades. It has everything to do with not letting your losses get out of hand. And I think that's a very powerful thing because anyone who's traded has, has multiple trades get out of hand. And it's really eliminating those all together. And again, that all comes back to you, obviously. And I love this one from Paul Tudor Jones. Don't focus on making money, even though that's intuitive. That often is what our focus is. Focus on protecting what you have in it and completely changing that mindset to being very protective. And finally, and this is with anything in life, and that is just having the right positive mental attitude. Um, again, all of those I think are self-explanatory. But I think just the important thing is really having the right approach to doing this. Trading is a microcosm of your life. Um, you cannot become a really good trader if the rest of your life is a mess and if you have a lot of emotional baggage. It's really difficult to go into your, oh, I'm going to switch all that on now. I'm going to become, all of a sudden become very disciplined, very patient. I'll show restraint. I'll be very conservative if you are not that already. There are no switches to flick on to become, okay, my, Rest of my life is a mess, no control, no discipline, but I'm going to be a good trader because I'll be able to somehow turn it all on when I need to. Um, I don't know how you do that. I'm not a psychologist, but I'd love to see how you could do that. So, you know, trading is a microcosm of your life. Um, and, you know, really trading is a psychological endeavour. At, uh, at the end of the day, it really is. So they're my sort of five unbreakable rules, so to speak. Um, in reading the lives of great men, I found the first victory they won was over themselves, self-discipline. I love this from the commander of the Allied Forces in the first Gulf War. I can relate to this very much being in the military previously, but, and I, but I see such relevance with trading. The truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, you always know the right thing to do. The hard part is doing it. If that's not trading, I don't know what is. <laughs> you often know, or you always know the right thing to do. The hard part is actually doing it, and I think that's trading in a nutshell. There's my three M's of trading, um, beliefs on strategies, and the five unbreakable rules of trading. I think that's probably my cue. Give uh, Hunter a few more minutes at the end. I, I will quickly say the numbers stayed fairly consistent throughout the session, which is always a good sign for a presenter like myself. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you tuning in for an hour, and I hope I've provided you some food for thought. Um, and I'll hang around if there's any questions from Hunter or anyone else. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, and all the best. Thanks, Hunter. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, wonderful presentation as always. Um, one of the one of the biggest things that I've um, gotten from Stuart is that that walk away. Um, you know, I'm I'm a forty hour a week guy. Sometimes I'm I'm on the road uh, for for long stretches. Um, you know, the the way I trade, I, I don't have the ability, really, the desire to trade in small periodicities, uh, to trade multiple times per day. I'm definitely more of a long-term trader, but even the few trades that I do take, the thing that I always remember to do is to place that trade. And even if I'm, uh, if, even if I'm at my cubicle at work, uh, and I have other things to do on my computer, I still 
walk away and go get some coffee and close down Metastock and then come back with kind of a fresh mindset and do the rest of the work for the day. Um, it's so important. And the reason it's so important is because once you have confidence in the tools that you have and the system that you use, it becomes so much easier to go ahead and hit that trade button, knowing that your, your rules are in place and that you can move on with your other daily tasks. Um, again, we were very lucky uh, to be able to work with Stuart and um, get his system within Metastock. Like I said, Trade Launch has actually been one of our best-selling add-ons for a couple of years now. We updated it uh, last year, I believe, with version 2.0. Um, it is a, a wonderful system. It comes with three expert systems. Uh, Stuart touched on his altitude system a little bit. It also comes with his ignition and slingshot systems. Uh, the expert advisors are very, very easy. They walk you straight through um, exactly which, you know, what the signals mean. Um, it's a very simple system. As you saw from Stuart's own charts, he, he uses a very, very basic, uh, easy to interpret system without all those lines. And I, I love that slide that he uses with all the, the different indicators on it. I can't tell you how many times I've seen charts that look like that in, in my days working here. Uh, it also comes with 28 indicators uh, in those come with trailing stops, reversal signals, uh, as well as overall market sentiment. Uh, eight explorations comes with uh, the add-on, as well as a template that I forgot to put into the slide. But the good news is, is with this PowerPoint, I get to go back to the drawing board a little bit on it so that I can change it and make sure that I know that that book is in its fourth iteration. <laughs> uh, wonderful system, you know, wonderful feedback on, the, on this system so far. Uh, over the last couple of years. Now, for attending this webinar, obviously we wanted to uh, give you guys a discount and give you the opportunity to use the system that Stuart has put together put together over the last couple of years. Normally this system uh, is $499. Uh, for attending this webinar, you will get $100 off of it, which is far above and beyond uh, you know, other discounts that we we typically use. Now, the way to uh, get this uh, promotion is you can give us a call right now. Um, if you're in the States, it's 1-800-882-3040. Come into our sales chat at metastock.com forward slash sales chat. You can also get in touch with Stuart um, at his website, Stuart McPhee. Uh, uh, com, or you can shoot me an email if all else fails, hunter.smith at metastock.com. Um, I'm looking through the chat. Um, looks like we have a couple of questions here. Uh, first off, many compliments on your presentation, Stuart. Um, everybody loved it as always. Uh, Copy of the presentation, can it be made available? Uh, Stuart, I, I don't know if you want to be, uh, if you want to send out your slides. Um, I, what I will be doing though, is I will be sending a recording of this webinar out to everyone in just about an hour. Uh, so you can go ahead and, and watch it again. I'm more than happy to provide a copy. I'll give it to you and perhaps if anyone wants a copy, they can email you or myself and I'm happy to send it to them. Great. Yeah, uh, guys in the audience, just uh, feel free to, to let us know if you'd like a copy of the slides. But, uh, as Stuart said, we'd be happy to send them. Um, system tests. There are no system tests with uh, the add-on. Um, I think that's a good thing, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I, I've my, my philosophy, and, and Stuart, if, if you disagree, please let me know. But my philosophy is I think that that there should be a little bit of um, interpretation to most signals instead of a, a buy signal here and a sell signal here. I think you should really uh, take many factors in, into account when placing a trade. Um, and I don't think every situation is the same. So Stuart's system is designed a little bit more towards interpreting uh, valuable signals and coming up with a conclusion on your own versus a, hey, this is where you buy and this is where you sell. 
Um, would you agree with that, Stuart, or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, correct. So you saw that explorer exploration result. There were 20 odd stocks there. I'm not trading close to all those 20. There'd be one or two. So there is definitely interpretation. And a system test would be unfairly because it would trade the other 18, whereas I wouldn't. And I explained that a bit in the notes and what have you. Okay, wonderful. Um, a couple of questions on getting the add-on. Like I said, getting the add-on, just uh, shoot us an email or come into sales chat um, and mention that you're in this webinar and we'll give you the discount. Uh, quite a few people asking for the slides. If you could shoot me an email um, at metastock, uh, hunter.smith at metastock.com and, and once I have that PowerPoint, I'll send them over to you. Other than that, I think that kind of wraps it up. Stuart, I, I want to send you a special thank you for uh, um, uh, speaking today. It's always a pleasure, always a great webinar. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, to everyone out in the audience, thank you for uh, hanging around with us for an hour. Uh, we hope that uh, you got some uh, valuable tidbits and, and uh, things that really help your trading out of this. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and as always, happy trading.